Hi, this is Rob Knight from Your Itinerary. I want to invite you to join me and Rick Garrity in the Rocky Mountains this August to explore Colorado's frontier past. We'll shoot trains, ghost towns, and lots of interesting characters along the way. Oh yeah, and the scenery's pretty nice too. Find out more at digitalphotoadventures.com. Thanks, Rob. And I want to let everyone know that I still have a few openings left for my workshop in Cuba in early November. Just head on over to dougk.com slash workshops. Thanks. Hello, this is Doug Kay. I'm here once again with Gordon Lang on the other side of the planet, and we're here for another episode of All About the Gear. Good day, Gordon. Hello, Doug. How are you? I am doing very well. It's early here. It's beautiful mid-afternoon or late afternoon for you. Um, well, welcome back for another show. We're going to talk about uh, a very different kind of camera here. I'll tell you a little story. I was at a graduation, a family event in a large venue, basically a stadium sized event and sitting in the bleachers and in the row in front of me was a guy with a little teeny camera and he held it up and he had zoomed way into the stage far away to get a picture of his son graduating. And I was amazed looking over at his shoulder because he had essentially a full height image of his son, rock solid, steady shooting video. And I had to tap him on the shoulder and say, what the heck is that camera? And it was uh, a Sony something or other at that time. And I didn't pay a lot of attention until I read your reviews of this type of camera. And uh, I, I was sort of fascinated by them. So we're going to take a little departure from the high end uh, cameras and talk about these guys. What, what, what are these cameras, Gordon? Well, I think we call this category the pocket super zooms or the travel zooms. And it was invented back in 2006 by Panasonic. And back in 2006, compact cameras were in their heyday. Well, maybe not their heyday, but certainly not in the doldrums as they are now. Back then, there were so many different types of compacts. You could get ones that were very slim, ones that were very attractive, ones that um, had slightly bigger sensors than normal. And then Panasonic came along and went, you know what? Let's introduce this new category where we try and squeeze the biggest zoom possible into this compact body. And this was at a time when three times and five times zooms were kind of the norm in this form factor. So they came out with the TZ1. This was a five megapixel camera in 2006. It had a 10 times optical zoom. 35 to 350 millimeter equivalent and it was amazing people couldn't believe it it was like the story you just described there you'd, you'd start at wide angle and you'd start zooming in and you'd get closer and closer and closer and it wouldn't stop it was like wow this this is the most incredible camera of all and it was a massive hit for panasonic so then they went to another generation of it and still they were the only people making them and then they went to another one and gradually the other manufacturers cottoned on and Sony reacted, Canon reacted, Nikon reacted. And now all of the manufacturers offer this uh, type of compact camera. And the interesting thing as we fast forward to 2015 is that it's one of the few categories in the compact point and shoot market that is still thriving. Because of course the, the three time zooms, the budget cameras have been superseded by phones. People use their phones instead. If you're after something with better quality, you can get a really large sensor in a fairly compact camera now or go up to a mirrorless camera. So slowly, all of these different compact point and shoot categories have been wiped out by the technologies. But the one that remains is the compact travel super zoom camera. And as we'll discuss in this show, the current optical range isn't 10 times, isn't 20 times, but it's 30 times optical zoom. In a body, I'm going to hold up for people watching the video. This is the uh, the market leader. This is the Panasonic's TZ70 or ZS50, as it's known in North America. This is the size of camera that we're talking about, or even smaller in some cases. And believe it or not, this packs a 30 times optical zoom. All right. So for those also watching the video, uh, we're going to show you just a little clip of Gordon um, using this camera. I think it's in Brighton, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. This is uh, taken from Brighton Pier, looking back at the seafront where we've got a great big uh, Ferris wheel. And I think this was taken when they'd removed all of the pods for cleaning or for maintenance. So you won't see a, a great deal on it. But it, what, what amazes me is, as you said at the beginning of the show, is how you start off with this really wide angle landscape type view. 
and you get closer and closer and closer to this amazing degree of detail that you can just pick out. I mean, just when you look at videos like this or you describe it, it's pretty obvious that you could this this becomes the perfect travel holiday camera or even for wildlife shooting or basic sports, that sort of thing. And typically the range that they're offering is between 25 millimeter equivalent, which is pretty wide, to 750 millimeter equivalent, which really is a super telephoto. I mean, that's a massive, massive zoom. There are longer zooms now. You can get 50, 60 times even more than that in a larger form factor. But the critical thing about these cameras is they will squeeze into a trouser pocket. And that, that's still a very compelling offering. I mean, what, one of the keys to that example is how rock steady it is. And that's the stabilization in these lenses is quite phenomenal, isn't it? Yeah, well, I should uh, point out that that one was actually filmed from a tripod, but I also have lots of clips which are handheld that you can see in my reviews of these cameras at cameralabs.com. And the stabilization is utterly remarkable. As we've discussed many times on this show before, I'm not the steadiest of, uh, of photographers. My hands do wobble quite a bit. So it's very good for me to test the stabilization on these things. And it is utterly remarkable, not just for stills, as you say, but for video as well that you can so comfortably zoom from wide angle to super telephoto and keep a rock steady image. I've also used them in, in the example that you gave earlier in a, in a concert where you're not, not a music concert. Cause I, I, I have to say that's one of my real bugbears. When, when you're at a concert, you're there to enjoy the show, stop holding your phone up and recording it or your camera. And I'm not one of those guys, but you know, if it's your kid's show or, or something like that, you know, discreetly point it in between the shoulders of people. So you're not in the way of the person behind you, but being able to really fill the view with just your kid and maybe one of their friends is is amazing and i i love being able to do that and being able to do it handheld as well it's remarkable now when i first read your review i decided i just wanted to check out these cameras so i went out and bought what was the current version at that time i'm holding up my bright red canon sx 700 hs which is in this same category it has a 30x optical zoom, but it also has what's called a 60x digital zoom. What's the difference between the digital zoom and the optical zoom? Okay, this really extends the range, but it does so by effectively cropping the image in the middle and enlarging it. And it can enlarge it with interpolation, or it could just reduce the resolution. There's lots of different ways you can do it, but the bottom line is it's not actually delivering any greater detail. So that, at least for stills anyway, so the optical range stops at 30 times. That's when the actual optical lenses stop magnifying the image. And beyond that, what's happening is an, is an electronic zoom effectively. It's taking a, a decreasing area in the middle of the picture and stretching it to fill. Now, there is one per place where this can actually work, and that is when you're filming video. Because if you think about it, these cameras are, what, 12 to 20 megapixels in resolution. That means they're about four to 5,000 pixels wide, the still images that they're capturing. Now, if you're filming 1080p video, that frame is actually just under 2,000 pixels wide. So really, you've got a lot of spare pixels left there. When you start off with, say, 4,000 wide, you've got twice as many as you need. So it is possible on some cameras to do a very clever digital teleconverter, effectively, which crops a 1080p frame from the middle of the sensor and enlarges it with no loss of resolution because it was only really delivering a two megapixel image to start with. As I understand it though, not all of these cameras or indeed maybe not even any of these cameras do that. This is a kind of feature that you would only really see on a higher end camera, such as Panasonic's uh, mirrorless cameras. Some of those offer that digital teleconverter facility, which does a one-to-one -one crop from the sensor. So typically that's a very long, typical Gordon a convoluted way of saying digital zooms are not always a great thing or rarely a great thing. They're just kind of generally, especially for stills, they're cropping a little square in the middle of the picture and enlarging it. So you're reducing quality. You could do it afterwards, you know? I mean, if you got a, took a still picture at 30 times and then just cut out a bit in the middle, then you've effectively given yourself a 60 times or a 100 times zoom anyway. So always take digital zooms with a pinch of salt when it comes to still photography. And, and speaking of resolution, um, Panasonic did something unusual when they went to this version from the previous version regarding the, the resolution of the sensor. Gordon, tell us about that. Yeah, that's right. So in this show, I really wanted to discuss four models, the four current 30 times zooms from the market leaders. There's Panasonic's TZ70, or as I've said, it's the ZS50 
in North America. There's the latest version of what you've got there, Doug. It's the Canon PowerShot SX 710 HS. There is the Nikon Coolpix S9900. And there is a brand new one, the Sony HX90V. That's a Cybershot camera. It's not launched by the time we made this show, but I have handled that camera at a Sony preview event. These are the four main products for 2015. Now, there's going to be others by some of the manufacturers. I'm sorry I can't cover everything in this show. Now, they've all got 30 times optical zooms. They all have Wi-Fi with NFC. These are things that they all have in common. However, one of the first things that they differ on is resolution. And interestingly, the Panasonic TZ70 or ZS50 has the lowest resolution of that pack. Uh, the Canon's the highest at 20 megapixels. Um, after that, there's the Sony at 18, the Nikon at 16, and now the Lumix here with 12 megapixels. The previous generation was 18. It's gone down from 18 to 12. And the reason Panasonic have done this is that all of these cameras, the reason that they can pack such a massive optical range into such a small body is because they only have to satisfy the requirements of a tiny little sensor. They call it a one over 2.3 inch sensor. It's, it's tiny. It's like a, a kind of little fingernail size sensor. Now, when you've got a sensor that small, if you're shooting at the lowest ISO under bright light conditions, they'll all deliver pretty good quality. And in my tests, I found the SX710HS, the Canon, was very nice and sharp and detailed. And it, it did give you 20 megapixels worth of resolution. However, when you start bumping the, the ISO up to even 200 on these models, they really begin to suffer from noise and reduce dynamic range. And that's because the pixels are so small. They're so tiny on that tiny little sensor. So Panasonic said, OK, here's something we can do. Why don't we reduce the resolution, make the pixels fatter, which makes them more sensitive to light, assuming that they're all using the same sort of technology. So that's what they did with this model. And in my tests, again, if you go to CameraLabs.com, you can see my noise uh, results uh, compared to the Canon. And indeed, it delivers a slightly cleaner image at higher ISOs. But conversely, given very bright light at low ISOs, the Canon resolves slightly more detail. To be honest, though, there isn't a great deal between them. I wouldn't myself make a buying decision based on their resolution. They're all delivering roughly the same quality. One of the interesting differences that makes the Panasonic unique compared to the other three models I mentioned is that it's the only one of uh, the group to be able to shoot in RAW. And if you're used to shooting with a bigger camera, you'd think, Raw, wow, yeah, I use RAW all the time. That's brilliant. I'm going to go for this one then. However, where you may be used to retrieving some highlight detail or some shadow detail with the RAW file from a big sensor camera, you're not going to be able to do that with one of these cameras. That tiny little sensor, there is no headroom on it at all. So you're not going to be able to retrieve any lost highlight or shadow detail. About the only thing you can do with these RAW files is adjust the degree of compression when you go to save it out. And of course, also adjust things like the white balance more easily. So when you look at cameras like this and you see that it's got RAW, do remind yourself that it's not like having RAW on a DSLR or a big mirrorless camera with a big sensor. Now, how sharp are the images from this? You know, uh, we all think, great, I'd love a 720 millimeter full frame equivalent lens, but how are those images gonna look when I'm zoomed all the way out to that focal length? Well, inevitably, what happens with a long optical zoom range is the contrast suffers at the long end. They start off looking brilliant at wide angle. And as you zoom further and further in, the images typically become softer and softer. However, the manufacturers are getting very clever at compensating for that and applying greater contrast. Or, of course, that's something that you can do either in the pitch profiles or on your computer or on your phone when, you, when you're sharing it later on. I actually find the quality from these cameras remarkably good, even fully zoomed into 750 or, in this case, 720 millimeter equivalent. I mean, it's remarkable to me that they work at all. So the fact that they deliver quite a respectable-looking image, and again, I've got sample images from all these models if you want to download them at their full resolution, and they, they look very respectable. I'd, I'd be pretty happy with them. And that, again, is because they've got this tiny little sensor so they can, believe it or not, produce quite good quality optics, even even in the constraints of a, a body this size. So would you, you know, when we think of focal lengths of that length, we think of things like uh, shooting birds, going to Africa and, you know, mm -hmm. photographing the wildlife or even sports. Does this, is this a camera you'd consider for that application? Yes, no. I mean, that's the dream, isn't it? Is that you could take something like this on a safari or to a sporting game and get amazing pictures. Well, you can so long as the light is good and the subject isn't moving. Okay. So in other words, for, for, bird, for, 
for birds that don't fly in the middle of the day and for uh, uh, maybe gymnasts before they're moving, when they're ready for their warm-up outdoors, right? Outdoors, yeah. Because remember, the if I mean, if I just read the specification of this lens, the focal ratio of this when it's zoomed in is f6.4. That is not particularly bright, which means you're going to really be shooting – in dim conditions at say 1600 ISO with a camera like this, these cameras do not look great at 1600 ISO. You know, that's a tiny little sensor, remember. So first of all, the, the image quality is not going to be that great. Secondly, the focusing on them is not very, very fast, especially when you're looking at tracking a moving subject. So for birding, actually, you can just about get away with it. If the bird is sat in the tree and it's not doing a great deal, you can get some pretty good shots with this around Brighton. Uh, I mean, in the sort of best case scenario where I live in Brighton, it's a seaside town. We have a lot of seagulls. They're outside during the day in the middle of the, you know, bright sunlight. I can get some great pictures of them with these. But if it's in a tree and it's dawn or dusk, it's going to be struggling. It's not going to look as good. You've got to be realistic about this. And I've been on a safari not with one of these cameras, I, I should add, but I do remember that some of the animals were moving very quickly, but some of them were not moving at all. They were, they were keeping very still. So you've got to kind of rein in your expectations. If the, if the subject is not moving very much and it's under fair lighting conditions, then you will get a fairly good result with a camera like these. But if it's getting dimmer or the subject is moving, you're going to be disappointed, I, I would say. It, it's certainly a, a heck of a lot smaller and less expensive than my big Nikon kit with maybe a 200 to 400 millimeter zoom. Rather remarkable. But like you say, uh, I wouldn't expect anywhere near the same kind of experience. Mm, definitely. What, what about, talk to us about what it's like to use this camera, the controls, viewfinder, LCD. How, how does this camera feel to you in the field? Well, you've mentioned something very, very important. Uh, of those four cameras that I uh, mentioned earlier, they all have different ways of composing. Now, if I turn the TZ70 or ZS50 around, you'll see in the corner here, if you're watching the video, or if you're not, I'll just describe it. In the corner, top left corner of the camera, when it's facing you, there is a tiny little viewfinder window. Now, this was a feature that was brought in on the previous model, a little electronic viewfinder. Now, the view it gives is tiny. It's very, very small, and it's not very detailed. On the new model, it's still tiny, but they've increased the resolution, so at least it looks quite sharp. But the important thing about that is it lets you hold the camera to your face to compose, and that now gives you not two, but three points of contact. You've got your two hands and your face. And believe it or not, that gives a lot of extra stability. And when you're shooting at 720 or 750 millimeter equivalent, especially if you're filming video, that extra stability really, really helps. And of course, there's the other benefits of a viewfinder, which is being able to shoot more comfortably under very bright lighting conditions. So for me, this is a real killer aspect of the TZ70 or ZS50 is having that built-in electronic viewfinder. But it's also something that the Sony HX90V has, although they've done it in a different way. You'll see on the Panasonic, or as I described, the viewfinder is always visible in the top left corner. However, what Sony have done, oh yeah, now the downside of that is look where, look where they put it. It kind of sits above the screen. So you've got this kind of blank area above the screen and it makes the camera taller. And it also means that the aspect ratio of the screen is wider than the native image shape. What Sony have done is exactly the same as what they've done with the RX100 Mark III. The viewfinder pops up from the top surface, so it's not ready to use if you just hold it up to your eye. You've got to spring it up and pull it back to bring those optics out. But what that means, because it comes from the top, not from the back, it means that it can be shorter, and it means the, the, the body, rather, can be shorter, and it can have a 4 by 3 aspect sh uh, shape screen which matches the native shape of the images. What this all means, the bottom line is, the viewfinder is not as quick to use as it is on the Panasonic, but it allows the Sony to be smaller. So there are two slightly different approaches of implementing electronic viewfinders, but again, when you're shooting at very long focal lengths, they're very, very useful things to have because they give you that extra stability. Okay, uh, that's great. I, I like that. You know, I was looking around here trying to find my Sony RX100 Mark III, which is one of my favorite cameras that has the pop-up viewfinder also. So um, uh, it's a great, I love having a viewfinder. I've said this many times on this show because uh, I wear bifocals. And if I have to use a rear LCD, 
It's not bad if I'm shooting down low or up high, uh, if at least if it has tilt. But if I'm shooting straight ahead, I have to do the old bifocal thing. I'm, I'm the old man with my head tilted back like this. And I, I find it's much easier at eye level to use an EVF. Um, when I'm shooting up high or down low, I love a tiltable screen. Speaking of which, I'm glad you mentioned tiltable screen. So on the TZ70 or ZS50, which I have here, if I turn it around, I've turned it on as well. So look, there I am. Oh, look at that guy. A screen on the screen. Now, this is a fixed screen, and I feel very comfortable tapping it here because it is not touch sensitive. Panasonic removed the touch sensitive screen on this a couple of generations ago, and I didn't forgive them on the last one. I still don't forgive them here. And annoyingly, of the four cameras that I mentioned, none of them, none of them have a touch screen. That is so irritating. I'm so annoyed with them for removing that, and I wish they would put it back. But Panasonic, not only is this not touch sensitive, it's fixed in place. Same as your Canon that you have there, Doug, and the latest SX710HS. However, the Sony HX90V has a vertically tilting screen. So I'm, I'm, if you're watching me on the video, I'm pretending to tilt this screen out. You know how it goes. It'll tilt out, and I believe it also faces forward for selfies. I can't quite remember from the preview uh, whether it did or not. But the fact is it had a tilting screen. Now, Nikon takes that one step further with the S9900, and its screen is side-hinged. It can actually not only uh, tilt up and down, but it can come out sideways. So both of those offer some screen articulation. So when you look at the Sony offering a viewfinder and screen articulation, then I think it could be, you know, I mean, it doesn't do raw files, but for me, that's a bit of a uh, red herring. The Sony could end up being the best featured one. And this is always something, this is something Panasonic has to watch out for because it always had the, the TZ, the flagship TZ, which is the one I've got here, was always the leader in features. It was always the most expensive as well but it was the one that had the most features. But now Sony's going, hey, look, guys, we're going to go after you on the features on the ATX 90V. Also offer a cheaper one. That's what all the manufacturers do. They offer cheaper versions as well with slightly cut down feature sets. One of the other interesting things that's changed between this camera and its predecessor is that Panasonic has removed the GPS receiver on it, as has Canon. Now, both cameras allow you to sync GPS positions over a uh, Wi-Fi connection with the smartphone app. And as we've discussed in previous shows, there's nothing stopping you from running a third-party app on your phone and recording a log for syncing later. But there is nothing to beat the convenience of having a GPS receiver built in. And that is what Nikon have done with the S9900. I will just verify that that is the case. Yes, it is. And it is what Sony has also done with the HX90V. So... That Sony is looking quite compelling now. You know, it's got the tilting screen. It's got the pop-up viewfinder. It still has the built-in GPS receiver. But as a consequence, it's also got the biggest price tag. Do you think it's a good time to discuss how much these things cost? Yeah, tell us about it. Okay. Because so I think the, the, the key here is, I, you know, there are probably many people like me who are curious. Uh, they want to use this not for their, let's call it serious photography, and we get into trouble whenever we talk about serious photography, but they want a point and shoot um, for taking family photos. And like you say, the the mobile phone has become the default, the go-to camera for family events, except in the case where you want that, that long focal length. So let's say I've decided that I want a camera in this class. How am I going to pick between them? Talk about, as you say, talk about the price and then help us figure out which one is, might be the best. Okay, so the Coolpix S9900 and the Canon SX710HS uh, at the bottom end of this market, they cost typically about 330 US dollars or about 270 Great British pounds. Next up is this, the TZ70 or ZS50. This comes in at about 400 US dollars or about 320 British pounds. So you're looking at about a $70 or a 60 pound difference between this and those entry-level models. Um, certainly, compared to the Canon, if you think about it, this and the Nikon, you're getting an electronic viewfinder for that. You're getting the ability to shoot in RAW. So these are, I think, some pretty compelling things in the Panasonic's favor. You've also got, however, on the Nikon, the fully articulated screen, so that, that kind of, and a, and a built-in GPS receiver. So it's that, that you've got a way up. 
and a cheaper price. Then you've got the Sony HX90V. Now, at the moment, this camera is not available. So the only price we've got is a recommended retail launch price, which is $430. That makes it the most expensive of them all. However, I would expect as soon as it comes out that it will be discounted a little bit and will become close to the $400 mark. Uh, so again, in pounds, I'd expect about 330 to 350 pounds. So again, you know, you're looking at spending $70, 70 or $80 extra to guarantee a, a viewfinder. And I think, and in, in the case of the, the Sony, that tilting screen as well, I think that's money well spent, really. How about you, Doug? Would you be willing, if you'd already thought I'm willing to spend 330 on the these kind of budget models, well, not budget, but, you know, the cheaper ones, would you be willing to stretch another 70 bucks to get one with a viewfinder? Uh, I probably would. You know, at the time I bought this, I don't think that was, was that an option at the time I got this? I think no. I went for one of the cheapest at this. At yeah, this Canon, point. Canon don't do one at that point. Yeah. With, uh, no, with but I had, the, you know, I had the choice of the others that you reviewed at that time. And that wasn't, that's not a brand new review. We should point out. This is one that, uh, that I used to base the decision on. It's essentially, you're looking at the, in some cases, the slightly previous models, let's say. Mm. Um, uh, but you know, for me, um, yeah, I would go for the viewfinder probably more than the GPS. I might go for the tilting LCD before the GPS. I love having GPS in the camera, uh, especially for travel photography, because I love to see where I was or street photography. I want to know exactly what street I was on. We've talked about the alternatives to having GPS built in, but it, like you say, it's awfully nice. The only problem is I find GPS tends to drain batteries more quickly than not having GPS by quite a bit. Um, and I'm glad you brought up batteries there, Doug. I, you know, that's that, another difference. That was, that was my segue. My notes say, ask Gordon about batteries. Well, I'm glad you asked me, but I'm glad your notes told you to ask me about the batteries because three out of four of those cameras of, that we're talking about can be recharged over USB. Now, I get into big arguments with people about this that I, for some reason, I keep coming across people who think that USB charging is a bad thing. They want to recharge the battery outside of the camera. Now, I can see the reason for that when you're looking at a higher end camera. They don't want to tie up the camera while it's charging. They want to be able to slot in another battery and go. However, with a camera like this that you take on holiday, most people probably will not have a spare battery. They will only have the one. So the ability to recharge it inside the camera, to me, is very, very useful because, first of all, you don't need to carry the charger with you because you already have it. It's, it's the camera is the charger. Secondly, you do it with a USB connection, and there are USB connections everywhere. There's one in your laptop. There's uh, one that you use to charge your phone or your iPad uh, that you brought along with you anyway. There's probably a socket in your car or a coach or an airplane that you're traveling in. If you're like me, you maybe have a, a USB battery that you use to top up your phone on, uh, you know, to last you through the day. You can use that same battery to top up these cameras. The exception here is the Canon SX710HS, which still uses an AC a charging unit which means you need to find a main socket which you may not be able to do when you're traveling around that easily so i think usb charging is uh, is very is, is very very useful in the camera in this category actually to be honest i think it's important in the camera in any category i wish they all had it but it's ex it's particularly compelling in a camera that's supposed to be pocketable and that you're taking traveling with you because if I'm, say I'm at one location and I take a load of pictures and then I've got a coach ride to another location, I can top it up in the coach, either on their own socket or on my laptop or with the portable battery. Not if I've got a an AC system, though. I need to wait till I get back to my hotel room or, you know, until I get back home or to an office. Mm -hmm. So the ones that require AC charging are the ones where you really do need to buy a spare battery if you intend to be out and about for a while. So that, that's another difference to weigh up between now, them. What, one of the things, now I don't know if it's true of all of these models, but something I noticed about this camera in particular is also that it retains a charge if it's unused for a very long period of time. I have an interesting use case for this camera, and that is I leave it in my car. And it'll sit there for maybe two months without being used. Uh, and it's only when I don't, when I find myself without one of my other cameras and there's something I'm driving along and I want to photograph something somewhere, 
and it's there. And I take it out. I haven't used it in two months. And it at least it indicates that it's still fully charged. That's not the case for my bigger Sonys, even my Nikons. They don't seem to hold the charge forever, but this camera does. Hmm. Maybe that should be a, a long-term test. I mean, the, the, I like to think that I do some of the most detailed reviews around, but they, you know, they take me two to four weeks to do, but that means that I never have them for more than two to four weeks. So well, plus, I can't really comment it, on them, you know, <laughs> how they perform after three or six well, months. Plus, plus you have to have the camera for a couple of months and not exactly. use it. Right? Exactly, exactly. So that's quite a unique thing. However, if anybody's listening to this show or watching this show and has experience of this, please let us know in the comments because this is useful information to find out if one of them is necessarily better than the other. I should, however, say Canon have got a little bit naughty recently with their battery indicators. I'm not sure if you found this. I found that they can be slightly optimistic for a while. They go, oh, yeah, three out of three, that battery life's three out of three, still three out of three. Oh, no, it's flashing. It's flashing red. Quick, take your picture. And it's like, whoa, how did that happen? And that has happened now for me on several Canon uh, compact cameras. And it's very disturbing because it seems to skip the, the single icon, the single battery indicator, and jump straight from two or three to flashing red and you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And that, again, could be alleviated if they allowed USB charging. Because if it is going to run out that suddenly and not give you too much notice, then I would like an opportunity to top that up as easily as possible. Gordon, this has been a really interesting show because this is a category of camera that a lot of people who listen to this show and who read your reviews at cameralabs.com probably wouldn't consider. Let me ask you this. Do you own one of these 30X Zoom cameras yourself? I have. I uh, usually buy one every year and use it as a reference model. And I, I generally alternate between the Panasonic and the Canon. The last one I owned was the SX710HS. I will probably buy the HX90V, the Sony, because even though it's the most expensive one, I find that combination of the tilting screen, the viewfinder, and the GPS hardware built in, that to me is, you know, and the, you know, the USB charger, you've got the Wi-Fi, the NFC, it's got everything. I think this, so long as the image quality doesn't suck, I hope it doesn't, we won't know until we test it. This could be this could be the best one in uh, in this category, definitely. So Panasonic could better watch out because Sony are coming after them. Well, very good, Gordon. I want to uh, thank you for this. I want to let everybody know that if you want to read more detailed reviews of any of these cameras, uh, in particular, I have a feeling that when that HX90V is available, you're going to be able to read about it on CameraLabs.com. Head over there. And for $400, you can't afford not to buy one. And when you want to buy one of these cameras, also head over to cameralabs.com, buy them there, helps pay the bills. We really do appreciate that. Gordon, I look forward to being together with you once again for the next episode of All About the Gear. We don't know what we're doing quite yet, but I'm sure it'll be an exciting one. I would say as a little preview, Doug, I'm fairly confident our next one will be on the Canon 760D, their latest mid-range DSLR, known in North America as the T6S. And I'll be able to discuss the difference between that and the T6i, known as the 750D outside North America. Good old Canon's naming strategy. I believe that will either be the next one or certainly coming very, very soon. Well, very good. The one thing I've learned, the most important thing I've learned from this show is that it's much easier to pronounce ZS50 than it is to say ZS50. So I'm walking around the house talking about Zs now, and my wife looks at me very strangely. <laughs> is that because of the Zs or, the, or something else? No, no. I Well, you'll have to ask her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gordon, thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Cheers, Doug. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.